Yes, we're about to start now in our oh. webinar. Can I just uh, request some kind of uh, logistical rules, the house, housekeeping rules? Uh, for the housekeeping rules, can you please all as we end, uh, mute our mics? Can you please all mute our mics? Only the speaker will be having the mic on. And we also have our videos off. It will be only my video and the speaker at the time we are having a conversation. Right, uh, Prof, we can uh, start and then can you please move to the next slide? Right, uh, I would like to greet everyone and welcome you to our MUT a webinar on Africa against COVID. Uh, this webinar is organized by our marketing and communication section, and it is uh, going to be running for this hour. And in our midst, uh, we do have a guest from various areas, but in particular, we are having uh, also a student from the Department of Environmental Health, as well as staff members uh, who are participating. We know that we also have uh, some guests who might be joining us uh, from the other parts. So we would like to extend our uh, welcome and appreciate the opportunity that you have just given us to be part of us in this discussion. Uh, I have going to introduce you our guest speaker. Uh, this session may be for, for you to understand I will introduce the guest speaker and we have uh, four sections uh, that we divided our presentation and the speaker will speak in the section and then as we move to the next one, uh, we'll be addressing some issues where, where possible. I will interject uh, maybe for point of clarity as agreed with the speaker and then maybe clarifying certain areas, but we'll also allow you some time where we are posing questions, uh, interactive sessions, but it's only about five minutes uh, in the beginning, in the middle of uh, the program. Uh, let's straight go straight now to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Prof, can you please put your, I would like us to see your picture as we int I introduce you. I want you to be in the main now. Yeah, my picture should be on. All right. And uh, I'm having a uh, Prof. Kofi Kwaku. He is a senior research fellow at the Center of Africa China Dust Studies uh, based in the University of Johannesburg. And he is an adjunct faculty at the, fa at the Africa Brand Leadership Academy in Johannesburg. Very interesting issues that I think is important for this webinar. Uh, to know about him. He's a regular commentator and analysis on the Africa affairs, particularly uh, interestingly that he is also a commentator on COVID-19 in Africa and the future of the continent with a particular focus on Africa, China, Nexus. Uh, Prof. Kofi specializes in scenario planning. He is also very much informed involved in information communication technologies uh, that focus on Africa and its development. He was a coordinator of a program on environmental information systems in the sub-Sahara Africa uh, with the World Bank in Washington, D.C., where he led a program on environmental information system. Interestingly, he is, he is also an author, and he authored a book titled Africa.edu, IT Opportunities and Higher Education in Africa, which was published in 2003. And he has also published a, a think piece titled Afridomia, uh, the Future of African Freedoms. So we are dealing with a, a man here of multi-caps uh, with well experience and having multi-skills 
and in this case, we are interested to zoom in into the area of uh, COVID. As the university, we are focusing on Africa uh, uniting against COVID-19. Uh, Prof. Kofi, I'm handing over to you uh, to give your initial introductory session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Poswa. You're very kind to me to give me the title of prof. I'm not yet prof, but uh, we, we're getting there. So I want to also greet uh, all, uh, your audience in peace. And then so ho I'm hoping that uh, this engagement with them will help to educate all of us and then learn and also get ready and also build ourselves against something that's really devastating the continent and the world. These are troubled times and these are very difficult and trying time for all of us. Africa, a continent of 1.3 to 1.4 billion people is in the grip of something that's both scary, frightful and very difficult to understand and manage. It's a virus, something we can't see, something that attacks us wherever we don't expect it to see it, and we're almost unprepared for it. But the point is, why and how did this happen? Now, we can ask all kinds of questions, but what is very important is the kind of casualties, the kind of effects the virus has had, not only around the world, but also in Africa. Now, we know that uh, about 18 months or almost two years ago in March or somewhere about, but even a little bit before in December, uh, when it hit China, there was a huge panic around the world. And of course, seeing what happened with the new virus called the coronavirus or COVID-19, the whole world had to shut down because of the fear. And of course, that kind of fear has created all sorts of responses, policy responses, health responses, national, continental responses, community responses, and so forth. And even today, as we having this webinar, we know that Gauteng in South Africa is in the grip of another wave, which is called the third wave, which is now worrying policymakers and the government of this country, and of course, the people and the communities within which the virus is uh, wreaking havoc. Now, I won't give you the numbers because I think the media is doing already that job. And I've always asked myself, why is the media only giving numbers that are complete, that usually frightening people and hardly give ways to get people to unite against it to find ways to resist and to fight the coronavirus in a much more effective way. We're getting numbers of, um, um, you know, infections, numbers of uh, death, but we hardly get numbers of recoveries and then the true nature of this. But what is important for us is to ask the following questions. What sort of unity or African unity does Africa need to unite against this invisible virus? What sort of health strategies and health leadership that are necessary to combat this efficiently? And of course, are these uh, combat or strategies that we're talking about this unity uniform across the continent? We'll discuss all of that. But in the meantime, what I wanted to do is to set that context. And I always say that context governs meaning. So in the grip of this fear, fear mongering, fake news, uh, the depression that people are going through, losing parents and so, do we have any hope to really fight and unite to fight against this virus well enough? How are we doing this at all levels, especially community levels, continental level and national levels? And the most important for me is if this context governs meaning, how are we doing in South Africa? So on this note, I would like to sort of keep it there for a while and uh, hand it over to Dr. Poswa. Uh, thank you, Prof, uh, for the introduction. Nice and short. Uh, I would like us to, before we move to the next session, 
maybe uh, if people have questions on the introductory session, they can note their questions or points of clarity in our chat box, and then we'll be in a position uh, to address those as we continue uh, with the discussion. Uh, thank you, Prof, for setting the scene and giving us that background. I think we are saving on time on that. It will help us uh, when we deal with the uh, questions uh, later on. I would like you now, Prof, move you to move uh, to the next part of our discussion so that you can zoom in into the African uh, uh, context, uh, deal with the issues first, how African countries survived uh, the COVID scourge. So please start with that part, and then uh, you will move uh, to the issue of uh, how African values have impacted the behavior uh, that assisted uh, Africa in combating COVID-19. And we'd like you to give a little bit of explanation and expanding on that area. And thereafter, we will have uh, some kind of a discussion and hearing what we're picking up from our audience. I'm handing over back to you, Prof. Thank you very much, Dr. Poswa. This is a, these are two powerful questions that you put up there. And let's see what I can do. I may not be able to give you huge details about it, but what is clear is um, right from the start, I think we need to give credit to African leaders. I know uh, most of us have always been very skeptical and then suspicious about our leaders when it comes to fixing our problems fast and on time and with speed. But this time it came out a very, very encouraging way, the way African leaders got together. So there are many levels, of course. Uh, the first level is at the continental level, at the African Union level. And of course, as I said, it's such a big continent, 55 countries, uh, close to uh, 30, a little bit over 30 million square kilometers. How in the world do you really unleash and then master a, a, a system or a way to unite against COVID uh, on a, such a large territory? So it start at the continental level, but it also uh, took place at regional level as well in Southern Africa, East Af Eastern Africa, West Africa, Central Africa, Northern Africa. And at the AU level, which is a continental level, and many of you know the African Union uh, has taken very fast speed. Um, and at that time, we're quite fortunate to have, incidentally, President Sarah Maposa of South Africa, president, um, a chairperson of the African Union, so he gathered very quickly a great deal of all the Af other African presidents to be able to find an appropriate response to it. And while this was going on at the continental level, countries in Africa as well at national level were also deploying their own uh, rapid response to this crisis. And then of course, combating the virus was not easy because at that stage, there was not enough information to know exactly what was going on. So shutting down, um, having lockdowns, what basically was called hard lockdowns, were the first way to deal, which means shutting the countries, closing, closing borders, uh, stopping airlines, stopping people's movement were very, very uh, powerful ways to stop the virus. And with time, we've seen that it paid off because by and large, we've uh, based on what the WHO, the World Health Organization was predicting, close to a quarter of a billion people would die in Africa. That was very scary. And in fact, in Gauteng, we had also heard that uh, the government uh, of, the, of Gauteng was planning to have 1.5 million uh, tombstones or graveyards to be dug up. Th these were very scary times. However, as this whole crisis progressed and the policy response was really on par, we've noticed that in fact, the rest of the world was most affected, but Africa wasn't. So can we, what are the causes beside the, you know, uh, if you want the medical elements and then the policy shutting down and so forth, it seems somewhere, somehow, Africa tend to be, tend to have been much more prepared because of the kind of uh, reaction and, and responses to disease like Ebola, tuberculosis and all other much more deadlier diseases. And we found out but uh, with, with the evidence that in fact COVID 
Um, I know it's a controversial thing to say because the number of deaths is still, even if with the two people or four or five, it's still a, a, a number of people dying. So we need to be compassionate. But the projections of the World Health Organization and the projection by analysts and medical doctors and so forth didn't come true. So there's something that happened in Africa that works quite well. And I think as much as we haven't been, we haven't had the full explanation of it, it seems the immune systems of Africans and the immune, uh, the, the, the sort of uh, immune system that Africans have may have played a, a huge role. Our natural medicine and so forth that are not even explored yet may have played a great role. As much as uh, we know that our health systems were not really good and they're still not good, they're still struggling, there's something that really helped. And so these are, for me, some of the points that I can plug out. But at the same time, African unity was very essential. People paid more attention. If we take some case studies, if we took uh, countries like Botswana, Botswana was very quick to really deal with the, the virus, to really lock down and uh, use the mask, use all these health and medical elements that were necessary. Same for Rwanda, they were very quick as well. We'll talk about uh, in details. Madagascar came out with uh, its own medicine, and I know Madagascar was treated very badly, but we know that it's worked. Yeah, Tanzania had a different style. Uh, in fact, uh, President John Magufuli, the late Magufuli, who passed away uh, this year, didn't want to close his and shut the borders. He was uh, more of a sort of religious person thinking about, you know, God's going to help us. But incidentally, the uh, the virus didn't kill as many people as forecasted by the World Economic, uh, the World uh, Health Organization in Morocco. Moroccans, the, the king of Morocco did very quickly and swiftly. He worked a lot on providing a stock of chloroquine and other things. So we can see, in fact, if we do a quick assessment, African countries really survived largely. South Africa is still in the grip of it. For some reason, uh, we're not quite sure what's going on. Is it a behavioral thing? Are South Africans not really wearing masks or dismissing some of the uh, medical uh, uh, help and support? That's something to look at later. That's very quickly what I could say about the first question. On the second question, um, what kind of values can we talk about? There are many of them, I, I must say. We can bring about the values of Ubuntu, recognizing people into you. We can also think about the, the idea of solidarity, compassion, empathy. Um, another one is, uh, if you want, the, the idea that if you are uh, um, uh, caring enough and, and help other people, and many of you must know by now that South Africa is probably one of the most caring countries, and this has really been done by research. Uh, philanthropist organization give a lot more than any other places around the world. Um, this is very surprising, but South Africans got together, although we know the consequences of the lockdowns economically, politically, socially, and then also psychologically, depression, mental health problems, um, also nutrition problems. These are huge problems that we can talk about a little bit later. But for me, the behaviors that, that really, that the values that really help to, to really deal and unite against COVID were really Ubuntu, compassion, and solidarity. But of course, Pan-Africanism was also one point to think about the rest of the continent as well. So Dr. Poswa, this is in short what I can say. I can give more details when we get the questions. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, the, uh just about two questions I would like to pose, which are relevant that uh, I received uh, that might be relevant in this case pertaining to your to the points that you raised. Uh, the question is: uh, Africa is rich uh, in terms of culture and tradition. Now, the question that is being posed. How has uh, the African tradition affected the behavior of the African? Are there any measures in place uh, to effectively control the spread of the COVID in the African continent? 
uh, given uh, the issue that is pertaining to this. And the second relevant point that you need to maybe talk about is about media. Mm. You, you mentioned something about uh, the 1.5 million graves that were dug uh, in Gauteng. Uh, this obviously can be interpreted in many ways. Was it informed by uh, uh, the sign of defeat from the government or was it part of uh, the media uh, that was uh, perpetuating the fake news? And this is the question that is pertaining to this. How has the propaganda uh, promoted the fake news? And instead of educating people uh, to deal with the fatalities, and when it comes to COVID-19. Hmm. Let, me, let me start with the first one. And it, these are two powerful questions and very relevant. And, and in fact, very little has been focused on the role of traditional values that united and responded against the COVID-19. There's there very little that came out of there. And you can check, there's very little. In fact, there needs to be more research done into this. And I have to pull my hat out to some of the traditional people because if you look at those values of Ubuntu, solidarity, people really huddle together. And it's been going on for a while uh, before COVID-19, although a bit fragmented at times. What has really given the strength to Africans uh, across the continent is their ability to be together. And we looked at the responses by government. Uh, many have said that uh, a lot of the requirements and the restriction that came onto Africans were imported from Europe and the World Health Organizations that really were against um, communities or communitarians way of dealing with anything we have. So isolating Africans, isolating them, was a devastating blow because most of us live in groups and live united, live in communities. So isolating us was also a death call and we could see that. But most important, people in short, many didn't listen to this because they knew that their survival was in unity, in solidarity, in compassionate giving, in compassionate caring, in empathy. And that's in large part the, the, the part that really helped, in addition to that sort of philosophical way of uh, uh, value-based philosophy, they also use natural medicine that many of us, and we know, especially in South Africa, that close to 75 to 80 percent have a traditional doctor than the 25 percent. And this was a big debate because of the nature of fake news about the, the concoctions, um, you need to, you needed to take a concoction of ginger and this and that. I mean, all of these were sort of dismissed, but they seem to have been working. I mean, I remember that uh, on the on the media, on social media, uh, Vavi, the uh, sec former Secretary General of Kosatu, was also uh, uh, involved in um, what do you call that? Uh, steaming. And to fight against COVID when he was uh, when he was infected, and he managed to get out of there one way or another. Many people were using these these methods based on natural medicine that seemed to have helped a great deal of people. So that's what I can say for these values. The second one is the role of the media. My goodness, what a very powerful question! And we know, in fact, at the end of this conversation, I'll bring something very important: the role of context. Um, but also communication, you know, very, very important. And the media seems to have played a role that frightened so many of us at the beginning. And in part, they were right to raise the alarm, to force the government across the African continent to do something, to be proactive, to move, uh, because the speed of the, the, the virus and its infection didn't have to wait for big meetings and so forth. You have to move very quickly. And we could see the gap between the spread of the virus and the decision making. These were very tough times where most governments are still always waiting and very uh, not proactive, but they're very reactive. And that was very important. And the media did play a good role, especially at the beginning. But we could see also that some of the information that the media was uh, uh, publishing were not quite exact and 1.5 million uh, we heard coming out of the media 
from the government of Gauteng, the provincial government of Gauteng, were quite misleading after a while. But there was a point because from the World Health Organization, the fear that uh, two, uh, let's say 250 million Africans, close to a quarter of a billion people would die, really sent the shivers in the, in the minds of all of us and in our spines. So the media, as we know, love dramatic things, dramatic news, whatever it is they'll publish to sell their newspapers. And so we have this role and this responsibility and accountability on the media that needs a bit of check. Even this week and the last week, we keep, we keep hearing about the third wave, how bad it is, a great deal of fear mongering, scare mongering, and we hear about the numbers of infections and death. We don't hear much about the recovery rate, nor do we hear about what to really do to fight and unite against this COVID-19. So this is what I can say that for me, the media played a very, very good role at the beginning. It's still playing a good role, but it's a very mixed assessment for me on the media side. Dr. Posa? Thank you. Uh, maybe. The last question that I would like you to address linked to this one. You mentioned uh, the issue of Africans having a good uh, immune system. Mm -hmm. And now with the virus constantly uh, mutating and with the slow rate of vaccination, uh, what could you say about maybe this uh, having a contribution or an impact in uh, spreading the virus. Are there any projections maybe from uh, your side, especially we are dealing with the African content, uh, with the new variant uh, being discovered? Uh, what could be, or how could you advise people to be looking at and what could be done uh, in order to deal with the balancing of the mutation at a, at a fast rate and the slow pace of uh, vaccination, whereas even if people are having the good immune system, they might just succumb to the situation. Yes, indeed, Dr. Posa, you have a point. Listen, there's a great hope. I'm sure many of you have heard yesterday the very good news uh, that the president has announced that uh, South Africa is going to be the uh, what's called the technology hub um, for the coronavirus. This is for Africa. This is huge news. However, this news by itself doesn't fix this, the, 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 the situation and the crisis. This is a meta crisis leading from health issues, political issues, governance issues, policy, um, also, you know, health matters and mental health, uh, famine. I mean, the, the meta crisis is a huge crisis. So this is good news, at least to get that. So the president was quite uh, good to announce this, so this is hopeful. However, we know that the, the, the vaccine rollout hasn't worked as well as the president and uh, his government has wanted to have that done. So what are we counting on really? <laughs> Beside what we know, you know, wear a mask, social distance, don't go to places where, you know, there's huge gatherings. So we, I'm not hearing anything else. You can, is there any medical element to use? Are there ways to eat better, for example? What kind of food and nutritious food that could help us strengthen or alternative medicine or ways of ways of living that could help us fight this virus besides just rolling out the vaccine? The new narrative has been big on, you know, vaccinate, get vaccinated, because this is where now um, the government thinks it'll help to really, um, if you want, lower the risk of propagation and infection across the country. But again, coming back to this uh, uh, this uh, immune system issue, it's a very tricky and controversial one to say so. But what else, what other uh, element do we have? If we take, the, for example, the dysfunctional nature of our hospitals, our hospital cannot even uh, carry or deal with the number of patients that are now um, overwhelming them and being a burden on the system. So what else is really helping Africans by and large, if we didn't have that such a strong immune system, and who, what kind of, uh, of, of things Africans are using to really build that immune system, we don't know yet. We need more research towards it. But I really think we can't say it's luck, <laughs> because that's another point. We can't say it's luck. So 
back to the the element of of the rollout of vaccinations, I think the vaccine is one part of dealing with that. But also, there's the idea that, in fact, we're not having given credit enough to Africans who have taken into their own hands their own health sovereignty. They're looking at it and say, my goodness, what should I do if I don't get vaccinated or if I have to protect myself? How do I get this thing? So Africans are using all sort of method, um, as much as they, they may not be scientific, but they seem to have been working. And we have to give credit to that. So hopefully research will try to look at the nature of the use of uh, natural medicine, value-based way of, uh, of eating properly to strengthen the immune system. I mean, I know there is a great deal of the African potato. I'm not punting anything, but I'm just uh, giving an example that people are looking at all kinds of uh, combination to help the immune system while the vaccine rollout is coming on. But there's great hope. And I think the unity we're talking about is not just on, on uh, modern medicine, but also on quote unquote traditional medicine, natural medicine, and so forth. So it's a combination of all of that, ranging from what happened in Madagascar to Tanzania, to the DRC, to Morocco. So we are very, very fortunate that at least the projection of the, w, the World Health Organization hasn't really happened, that 250 million Africans didn't die. Dr. Posa. Thank you. Now let's move on to the next section. Uh, where you are, you can maybe cite out of the African countries. Uh, you did you give us uh, the content, the content, uh, context, uh, the continental context. Uh, you also give us uh, some context as well uh, that pertains to uh, the national country context and the community based in terms of uh, uniting the Africa against AIDS. I mean, against um, COVID-19. Mm. So can you please expand a little bit on there, citing sure. some of the uh, good uh, case studies? Sure. I will let, let, let me quickly uh, say that, uh, as I said again, this is a vast continent, 30, a little bit over 30 million square kilometers. You, can't, you can put so many countries in it. It's an unbelievable, vast, <laughs> vast territory. So breaking it down into four components, continental, um, continental response, national response, country response, and then also community response. So let me start with the uh, continental response. And I must say, you need to give credit for once um, African leaders managed to pull something and at the helm of it was President Sir Ramaphosa, who was the chairperson and he was replaced uh, early last January by uh, the new uh, president of the Democratic Republic of Congo, um, Etienne Chisekedi. But key to it is the response was very swiftly in, into, the, into the mix at the African Union level. There was a big meeting of the presidents. They agreed on finding a proper response. And in fact, President uh, uh, Sierra Ramaphosa put together a group of four, four powerful people from uh, of which was uh, former finance minister Trevor Manuel and then uh, three, the former uh, president of the African Development Bank and, and then to other people. But to look for resources and put a strategy to be able to deal with that. So at the African level, African uh, Union level, it was very well coordinated, I must say. The beginnings were really, really uh, well done. Um, they were looking for between 100 and 150 billion uh, US dollars to deal with the continental, the continental response to the crisis. In addition to that, this is only at the fundraising and economic side of it, there was a, a health strategy that was put by what was called the African um, CDC, the Center for Disease Control. And incidentally, there, there's something I know many people find it uh, uh, paternalistic, but um, the Chinese government has decided to build and to give huge amount of resources and money to Africa by building a new African uh, CDC headquarters in Addis, which is an amazing uh, uh, gift to be able to look at not just uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, COVID but other potential uh, deadly diseases coming up. So at the continental level, I think something was done there. But let's trickle it down to the next context, which is national. I must say at national level, many African countries 
have done their own ways of dealing with it. So as I said, in South Africa, many of you know what happened. For some reason, South Africa was one of the first hit. And we know that the uh, national strategies was challenged by uh, many of the behavioral, uh, 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 if you want, ways South Africans were dealing. A lot of people didn't believe in it at the beginning. People didn't pay much attention until the, 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 the infection rate was just multiplying, going exponential, until there was a hard lockdown. And then with graduated, if you want, um, lockdowns and so forth, the, uh, the, the country strategy, national strategy, has managed to reduce the infection rate and the death rate. But we know that the recovery rate was also very high. If you took Botswana, Botswana did very quickly lockdowns, um, getting people to really follow up. And I, most of you already know how Botswana can be tough. Government of Botswana can be tough on, on their citizen when it comes to discipline. I think that was very, very important. So they managed to really uh, deal with it much quicker than in South Africa. Um, in Zimbabwe, it was a very difficult one before. But I must say, recently, with the help of China, um, Zimbabwe has managed to vaccinate, uh, uh, the rollout vaccination has gone to more than 2 million uh, people being vaccinated and still growing very, very fast. So there had been a little bit of pickup here. In Rwanda, under President Kagame's uh, 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 rule and government, they're also very disciplined there. They managed to shut down the country, very strict. And I think some kind of authoritarian element in dealing with this disease well, this, this, this crisis was also very important. And I think Rwanda has done very, very well. And in fact, they've got graduated uh, lockdown systems where the country is now opening up and having all kinds of things uh, uh, taking place. The second, or the third, or the fourth one is Madagascar. And Madagascar at the beginning was uh, also coming up and has come up with something against the virus. But they were really shut down by both the media the World Health Organization, pharmaceutical companies. So it was very difficult for an African country that was claiming to have found a, a kind of remedy or response to the, um, the COVID-19 was ridiculed. Um, but we can see now that in fact, uh, Madagascar has fared very well. And even today, much of what the, the research was showing that the, uh, the concoction that they came up with was working in, in one part or another in Tanzania. Um, the late president, John Magufuli, who was not uh, very favorable to locking down uh, his country, kept it open. Unfortunately, as we, we've heard lately, that he died of COVID-19 himself. But there are a lot of suspicion that he didn't. But uh, in any case, what happened in, 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 in uh, Tanzania um, at the beginning was fine. But then... Uh, there was an increase in cases in Tanzania, but not as bad as people have thought or projected. In Morocco, this is a northern African country in the northwestern uh, part of Africa. Uh, the king and his uh, council there did a fabulous job at reining in, finding quickly chloroquine and other medicine to deal with uh, the virus. And in fact, they were doing much, much better than in Europe. Uh, Morocco was doing much, much better than also other countries in Africa. So these are some of the cases that I can bring about. Um, I, the numbers have evolved, so there's no need for, for bringing that up. But the most important, what we could say about the continental response, the national response and the country response, but more so at community levels, most communities really took into their own hands how to deal with them. And one example, we've seen some examples in South Africa, we've seen also examples in, um, in Rwanda, where communities are strongly very well organized and managed to quell largely the spread of the virus. But there's still concern, but at least the response was swift, a bit more, um, if you want, uh, suitable to reducing the spread of the virus. This is what I can say. Dr. Poswa? Thank you very much. Uh, that was a uh, mouthful. And uh, talking about the context now in our African situation, which is the key of uh, this webinar. Uh, I just have a few questions for you sure. uh, around the issue of the countries. You mentioned the communities. Uh, we all understand that uh, many African communities 
uh, are very much uh, poor and living under uh, impoverished conditions uh, with no basic uh, services that would assist them. Now, what is your view about the issue of uh, resources that are needed in these communities to assist them uh, to continue with their initiatives that you say they took uh, to organize themselves? But we have a problem still. Mm. Uh, the issue of educating these communities, particularly health education. Do you think there is enough drive or is there any strategy that you could recommend uh, to assist the communities uh, to be given the right information uh, to be able to push and increase uh, the combat against COVID-19? Yes, this is a very, very good point because at the local level, that's where things are happening. And your concern is right. If you have communities that are not aware of how the virus is progressing, uh, the lack of information, something we call information asymmetry, which means poor communities don't get, they're, they're not as well informed as uh, wealthy communities that can really afford to have access to the internet, um, information that comes from Europe and any other part in the world and really build up their own defense system against the virus. Communities are at a huge risk and we can see that the kind of education that we have had so far has been very fragmented. And if you look at it, much of the information has been in English. While our communities have many, many more languages that they need. And when you have a scientific way of talking and mainly by experts uh, coming up with leveling up uh, COVID infection, I mean, the language of COVID is usually not quite accessible to poor people who hardly want to get uh, want to get to fit to defend themselves, and if the language is not simple enough, broken down into their own language, it becomes difficult for them to protect themselves and find ways to get together and fight and unite against this this virus. So, in short, um, I look at the role of government communication in South Africa. I must give it credit at the beginning of it. Very well done. The president was uh, in front of the camera regularly. But over time, I would have wanted the president to speak to his own people in their own languages. That was not done. That is not done today. The president keeps speaking to them in English all the time. And uh, But what they've also done was that they've managed to translate much of the uh, the president's speech into different languages in South Africa, in Isizulu, Isikosa, and then uh, um, Sepulana and all, all other languages. But it was not done enough for me and for people who are in the communication business to educate. So there's a huge need of a health literacy around COVID-19 that's still missing. It's not enough. People are still out there facing a great deal of fake news, the information, but give credit to the government. This hasn't been a very easy time. These are tough times to be able to make decisions quick to communicate all the time. So for me, I would want the president to be able to communicate a little bit more if it's not him, but he's um, his executive. And, and we know in the kind of uh, challenge we, we're in now with the health minister uh, not there, somebody's acting. So it's a little bit of a, a, a difficult situation for South Africa, but also across the African continent, the communication is not as easy because most of these poor communities are so far out. They're in places where the information doesn't get. However, with the reach of the internet and then the cell phones, uh, many are now getting the information, but they're also using the old natural medicine. They can't wait for the WHO to reach them there. So they're now doing their best, having their own ways of uh, feeding themselves, defending themselves. I mean. Most African uh, uh, local communities have gone through these things for centuries now. If you take the case of the Ebola virus that hit uh, Central Africa and then moved to West Africa in 2014, Africans have found ways to resist, to fight, to unite against the virus using their own local values and traditional ways of dealing with diseases for centuries. And in fact, this is what saved many of our great, great, great grandparents and still are saving them. 
So I would suggest a very serious and effective uh, communication campaign, health literacy, um, giving the opportunity to inform people about what is available. There is a debate, and I know this week the EFF have been asking the government, going to be asking the government why, for example, aren't the, the vaccine from uh, uh, China and then the vaccine from Russia part of the basket of vaccine choices that South Africans have? And so these questions are there and they're still being asked. And I uh, hear that uh, India has come up with also a new vaccine. So all of these should be part of a basket of choices that people need to use. But the government and the president were very clear about this to say, you can vaccinate, you must vaccinate, but you're not going to be forced to vaccinate. So people have the choices to be able to deal with themselves, to take into account their own health sovereignty. And I think this is more and more the trends that are coming up. People are taking to their own hands their own health sovereignty. And this is also a message for all your students who are listening to, to look at the kind of behaviors that they have to be able to fight and unite against COVID. Your behavior, if it's poorly done, if you're not putting the mask on or you're not finding ways to strengthen your immune system or being vaccinated, you put yourself at risk and the rest of your family at risk. So this is what I can say, Dr. Posa, at this point. Thank you very much for that contribution. I just have now, uh, well, I want us to have a little bit of, before we wrap up, uh, some interactive session where we look at uh, some of the questions or comments that we receive. Maybe before I get to the comments, uh, one more question is, uh, is there sufficient uh, investment that is being taken on balancing uh, the preventative health compared to focusing resources on the curative part, uh, which unfortunately becomes uh, too late at times. So your comment in that area, uh, so as to ensure that there is a balance between the preventative health as well as the curative health. That is the first part that I would like you to comment on. And then uh, the second question would be, which I receive, uh, what was the aim of government uh, allowing the African citizens who were coming to the country that were already having COVID? Mm. So uh, why there was no uh, stopping or a barrier uh, uh, bar barring those people from coming in? Uh, I don't know whether you want to answer those two and then I can give you two more questions. Yes, let me answer those first two. Uh, the first one is a brilliant question, I must say. Um, the, the balance between sort of uh, preventive uh, resources, uh, strategies, and then curative strategies. This is, this is something that really African nations have struggled with it. In fact, uh, we know the kind of challenges African health systems have gone through. Most African leaders go and get fixed go to medical hospitals in Europe, in the United States, in Asia. I mean, we've seen our leaders, we've seen in the old days, uh, Mugabe going to Singapore. Now we've seen the government of uh, the president of Ivory Coast and his prime ministers going to France. Same for uh, most of these, uh, 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 also the president of Nigeria going, spending six or seven months to London. And strangely enough, there's not enough health strategies to build our hospitals here. Uh, for some reason, we, we're struggling to understand why is it not happening, but most of us know why they're not happening. Um, our leaders are so bound into what's going on in other places. They're not building their own health systems. They're not making sure that their citizens are healthy enough to fight and resist against all these diseases that are really plaguing us. So these are big challenges. And also, we might, it's a tough thing for me to say the idea of corruption in the midst of this health crisis and meta crisis. We know uh, in South Africa, for example, um, Zwilim Kize, the health minister, has been accused of fund sending funds somewhere. And it, it gives a picture that we're not quite serious and then we're not strong enough on organizing the health system. But I must say, let's give him credit a bit. It was not easy. And this is where 
the idea of preventive strategy to be able to fund a campaign, information and education and health campaign to help people and our people understand why we need to be careful and serious about our health, that it's not just in the hands of the government. And this preventing side of it, it's such a very, very important issue because we need to anticipate. So far, we haven't done a great job in anticipating and preventing, and here we are. We knew that there was a possible third, even fourth or fifth wave coming up, but now our hospitals are in the mess, in a very dysfunctional uh, um, uh, state, and they can't even cope. So this is, a, this, is, this is a part that's really important in the challenge of preventing part of it. But we need to anticipate, we need to invest in that area. Uh, curative uh, strategies are usually very costly, and, and not only very costly, but also very uh, traumatic because of the nature of dealing with something that's at hand that's killing people. It's not easy to deal with it. There are very few countries that have been very successful, and I must uh, put, pull my hat to a few countries. First, China. China has done a great job as much as uh, the early element of the COVID-19 and uh, the infections were coming from there. They've got uh, close to a little bit over 5,000 deaths, literally. This is an amazing success for a country that's 1.3 billion and also uh, where people community-wise, their, their values are communitarians. They're, they have a solidarity and compassion for people. The key thing there were swift strategies to deal with them, the speed, the exponential nature of the way they put resources to not only prevent it, but also being curative. And I think these are lessons we can learn. But for some strange reason, it seems like many, many African countries are not learning much from China, including South Africa, I must say. And I hope in the long run that will happen. The next question was in, uh, remind me about the next question. I think I may have uh, forgotten a little bit. Dr. Posa? The, the next question was uh, saying, uh, uh, what was the aim of government? Yes. Uh, yeah. Allowing, well, mm, yes. Mm. Go ahead, go ahead. Allowing the African citizens to mm. come uh, into the country uh, yeah. that is already having uh, COVID. Yes. Well, I mean, this this is really sometimes it's a bit controversial. If we if anybody who has a a, a a short memory will probably forget that the first case of um, the first cases of COVID nineteen came from Europe through somebody a South African from KZN who went to Italy and brought it in here, and a lot of Europeans coming in. We don't hear that about uh, Europeans or other people coming from Asia. We hear that from our own Africans. And sometimes it gives the feeling that the fear that the media has put into people is seems to be paying off, that only Africans are the one bringing it here, carrying a disease or want to kill South Africans. We need to be careful when we think that way. A disease is a disease. And I think many other people were coming to South Africa. I mean, we had the, uh, uh, the British variant the last time. Nobody asked this question, why the British brought it here? How did it get here? There was also the Indian variant. Very few people were asking the same question, but suddenly it turns around. And this is one of the reasons people also thinking it becomes a bit xenophobic and we need to be careful. Um, this government, I must say, besides some of the, uh, uh, the challenges it's facing and some of the weaknesses, it done tremendous amount of work to really close the borders. It hasn't been easy. Those were coming from the borders and uh, we could see that with the media especially from the Zimbabwean and Mozambican borders, um, were really streaming in because they couldn't stay in Zimbabwe or, or Mozambique. But we know that the government is now building walls. This is another one, walls to keep them off, uh, the, um, the, so uh, keep them off coming to South Africa. So that defeats a bit the idea of African unity. How do you do that? Um, it's not easy. And the fear mongering also um, it's also a very difficult uh, element to consider, especially with the media attempting to tell people that, hey, look, these other people are bringing the disease, you need to keep them out. So it's not an easy position to have. The government and this government has done a tremendous amount of work to keep people out. And, and I tell you, 
to get into South Africa, it's not easy, especially now. So I think we need to put a little bit of water in our wine to think that only Africans are the one bringing uh, 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 the coronavirus in South Africa. Dr. Posa. Thank you. And, and then I I'll, I'll just want to, before you wrap up, uh, just take some few comments from uh, the chat. Uh, sure. But before, just note this particular question. Why misinformation about COVID origins uh, keeps on getting viral, uh, whereas uh, by now we should be reaching a stage whereby we have a, a clear understanding? That's a, a question that uh, you would be uh, addressing. Let's look at some of the chess uh, comments that are coming through uh, that might help uh, addressing if uh, some you could be addressing. And uh, the first one is pharmaceuticals, uh, namely uh, vaccination, have their place and limitations and also come at a cost which many African countries cannot afford. Considering that, uh, can, we can all see that, isn't it? Do I have mm. to read it? Mm. Mm. Okay, so let me let me get these two before my my mind uh, <laughs> forgets. The f the first one is the origin of the the virus. Um, for for it, it's really not that I'm dismissing this question, but at this stage, knowing the origin, I know in um, virology it's good to know the sources where it came from, and so that we could deal with it right from the start. But today, location really. Uh, as much as is important, is not as important as we think. Knowing where the virus came from uh, might probably help to set settle accountabilities. But at this stage, I think blaming where it came from, uh, in fact, it may not have come from China. That, that's, uh, I mean, I'm sure many of you are probably hearing about what's called the uh, coronavirus uh, leak theory, that it came from uh, a funding from the US uh, CDC, to the Wuhan laboratory, and then accidentally something just leaked out and then um, killed Chinese and then propagated around the world. So these are very interesting theory to spend our lives on. The key thing that I like into what you're saying and the reason why you brought us here today, Dr. Posa, is to see how do we unite against an invisible uh, killer that's ram rampaging in our world and in our lives and our families and our community that's the point. Do we have a strategy, a health strategy that is solid enough, efficient with health education, health leadership strategies to help us deal with it? That is the point for me, right? Yeah, there's an interesting question uh, to this, uh, uh, following to this one related. Mm -hmm. Considering that we have been informed that COVID-19 will be with us for a while and the possibilities of other pandemics should should not we need uh, should not we should not Africa uh, start uh, looking at our economic development? So the link uh, of the economic development to the possible expansion of uh, the disease. What could mm, you say mm, around mm, that? Mm, uh, mm. Uh, that's, an, that's an excellent question, and and uh, this is really the the question that really nails it. Um, so in response, I would say one of the biggest lessons and part of the wrap up of what I'm going to do as well with you is that we just got a huge uh, 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 calling, uh, a, a huge way to say wake up call to say you've got to get your health system in check, invest in your health system. A nation that's not healthy is not productive. That's 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 a clear consequences there. If we have people who are sick everywhere, they die, they can't produce, a nation won't be economically wealthy. So there's a, a strong link, the, the relationship between uh, investing in the health system, uh, the health of our people or Africans in general, and then economic health. These three, it's a powerful nexus. If our leaders don't understand that today and they keep investing in the wrong areas or, or taking money away from the health system or destroying it, then it's a criminal way to look at it. And we're not really, we shouldn't be uh, uh, um, taking this lightly. 
this nexus between investing in our health system, making sure we have an effective health system, is very, very important because it helps us to get um, healthy people. And then, of course, if we have healthy people, they can work. They can create an economy that's also healthy. And that's a very powerful uh, uh, point that I want to make. And then we need to take into our hands our own health sovereignty. We can't leave it up only to the, to the state to do that because the reason is simple. The state can do so much, right, that we also have to help ourselves. We also have to make sure we, we put into, into, into place um, uh, personal strategies, family strategies, community strategies on health, health education, you know, and health strategies that help the country as a whole, as well as the continent. Dr. Posa? Thank you. Uh, just maybe towards uh, our wrapping, uh, these uh, key points uh, are important. There are some related uh, comments that are being made, uh, which are talking about we're considering the issue of poverty. We're still, uh, Africa is still uh, poverty stricken, and therefore the issue of balancing the economy development and balancing the issue of improving uh, quality of life uh, will add a lot of value. There are comments that uh, are in the chat uh, that uh, are actually supporting that uh, area. One thing that I want us to maybe look at now in closing, uh, because our time is almost uh, finished, how has uh, the Western protocols helped or hindered the efforts of fighting virus, uh, the COVID virus in Africa? Mm. Thank you, Dr. Posa. So the first one, I mean, the, the uh, what I call the horseman, you know, in the Bible, we have the uh, the, was that the four or five horsemen in the Bible? I can't remember uh, coming into in the John uh, Revelation. Is that for us, there are so many of them. Uh, I, I came up with six of them, but you know the three. You know, poverty, inequality, unemployment. Now, now I can even add, you know, um, corruption, crime, and, you know, all other stuff. But the most important is poverty. If dealt properly, with um we know that the um the state of human beings poor people tend to have a poor immune system thus making them vulnerable to any other sort of very uh, opportunistic diseases and then creating a health system that's not adequate enough to resist or fight against any other a virus like the coronavirus um, so it is important that the government deals with uh, poverty and inequality, and it's just not about talking about it. And there's a lot of talking about it across the continent. They talk about it. Our leaders keep talking about it. But in truth, you don't see what they're really doing about it. I mean, uh, let me use this example. Uh, I know some people are going to say I'm biased. Yes, I'm biased because of the nature of this example. You know, for the past two or three, uh, I think three decades or so, one country, China, has managed to meet the, um, you know, uh, sustainable development goals five years before dealing with poverty. And according to the World Bank report and the IMF, the International Monetary Funds, China has is, is made poverty alleviation and even eradication a key element of their strategies and the way to do things. They don't just talk about it, they make it happen. 850 million Chinese were taken out of extreme poverty today. You know, th this is a huge, this is almost unbelievable. And African leaders talk about it, but they hardly really do enough to be able to deal with that. We have close to half of our population today in South Africa who are poor. You know, unemployment is at 30, what, 36 point something percent, that's official. And we know the unofficial numbers are very high. So I, I really praise the question the person has asked. So the link between poverty and dealing with health matters is very important. If we dealt with the basis of poverty issues, I think our health systems or our health state will be much, much better than before. So that's the point of, 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 of bringing this one up. And then the other one, if I still remember, what was the other one, by the way, I keep forgetting the, the double questions. 
I remember in the chat, Dr. Posa. Hello, Dr. Posa. Mm -hmm. Yes, the other comment in the chat was uh, talking about, let me just uh, uh, check that one now, uh, because I already moved from there. How mm. has the Western uh, protocols yes. helped yes. or hindered mm. uh, the fight against uh, uh, the cor uh, corona, uh, yes. COVID uh, Indeed. virus? Brilliant question as well. In fact, we can see that in, uh, we can see one of the one of the big impediments. Uh, we can see on both sides. I mean, um, one of the things diplomatic, uh, uh, the what people are now calling health diplomacy, with the coronavirus. Uh, in large part, the West, right, and rich countries uh, talk a good talk, but in fact, they're not serious about it. We've seen it already last week at the G7 summit. Finally, under pressure, most of these countries, including Germany, France, and the United States, were holding up on intellectual property rights on the vaccines that should have been should have helped uh, been produced very quickly and fast enough to to help poor countries rolling out. Well, in one way. This is a kind of hindering ways that the West works on it. Uh, China has done a, a much cheaper. Um, in fact, China's strategy was to, to have it in a cheaper way to help a lot of countries. And China is, uh, was helping India. China was helping Zimbabwe, was helping Kenya and other countries in Latin America. And in fact, there was a, 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 a New York Times article that was ranking the top 10 vaccines in the world. Guess what? The top four vaccines were Chinese. Yet, <laughs> we, we top ten because uh, in terms of uh, cost, and then also access, and then also delivery. So why aren't we not paying attention to that part of it? It just it's just a mystery to many of us. You know, to expand the basket of options for people to make their choices if they needed to be vaccinated. Now. The West is also uh, very, uh, if you want, they're also, um, you know, there's some compassion. The only problem is the compassion doesn't translate very, very quickly. They make money out of this. And we, many of you probably are aware that, um, that the International Monetary Fund have put some kind of basket of money, uh, special drawing rights for about, I think, 100, uh, what was that, 60 or 60, 67 to something billion U.S. dollars to help uh, poor countries uh, finance their responses against the coronavirus. But many of us are spe skeptical. In fact, I'm writing a piece on vaccine, um, vaccine economics, diplomacy, the IMF, and Africa, which hopefully will come out next week or the week after. And this, these are the, the problems we're facing, that while the West talks a good talk, there's no follow up really on, on helping it make it real. But we know uh, at the G7 summit uh, in, in the UK, um, the prime minister of um, the UK, Boris Johnson, has also pulled his own uh, uh, strategy to be able to help Africa. And the, the talk is good, but we want to see something um, clearly um, acting. We want to see something visible. And so far, I must say, I haven't seen it. So that Thank means so, so that means Africans got to be able to organize themselves and have the unity <laughs> to raise funds among themselves to deal with that. We can't count on people outside all the time. Thanks, Fosso. Thank you. And yeah, now we are wrapping, ending our end of our discussion, but there are some comments maybe you will have a, a closing remarks sure. that you will make but uh, i find these uh, points that came through as uh, of interest there is a comment that says what is sa doing wrong in your view uh, if we're looking at the world health organization african region dashboard uh, the update uh, it seems to show uh, that uh, African countries have been able to cap the infection and death rate. Mm. Like Burundi, uh, the death rate is uh, low at eight, and Sierra Leone, 82, and Guinea, 167. But if you look at the South African situation, we are having a death rate uh, 
or the death cases uh, standing at 58,000 and above. And we are contributing about 42.7% of death in the whole Africa. And uh, of uh, added to this, about 35% of the infections uh, for the whole Africa uh, are coming from the South African uh, part of uh, the continent. What is it that we are doing wrong uh, according to this uh, situation? That mm. is the question and the comment that uh, came from the yes. floor. Yes, let me take that quickly. I think there, there are probably many reasons. I know focusing on the wrongs is not easy. These are very uh, contextually, micro contextually, um, the, the environment in most of these African countries are not the same as that of South Africa. But also it could be that culturally, there are ways of doing things that probably, um, you know, South Africans are much more freer. They don't want to respect government uh, uh, restrictions and they're not wearing the, the masks. They're going to different places. I mean, we've seen how President Ramaphosa almost cried on uh, one of his uh, 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 speeches that South Africans, please don't, don't, don't expose yourself. Please, I'm asking you, I'm begging you. I think it was, when was that? I think uh, right before Christmas. So there may be different ways of, of, of doing things that are probably encouraging the virus to spread much quicker in South Africa. So South Africa is sitting on a very difficult um, uh, challenge to manage. The responses the big, at the beginning were excellent. Now we're seeing that a great deal of people are not paying attention to what the government is saying because of the kind of recovery rates we're getting. And of course, the information that's also coming out of there it's saying that, you know, um, older people on the, uh, beyond 60 and beyond and those who have comorbidities will die. So people are looking at it and say, well, I'm strong enough. Um, I can go out. Although some young people are dying. So the difference is we have to take them very carefully. Uh, other Africans are doing things in a way that sometimes people are saying, well, there's not enough tracing and tracking to see the real, to get us the real data about what's going on there. But at the same time, we must give them credit. In fact, those projections by the World Health Organization to 250 million dead haven't happened. So there is hope here. And that hope needs to be mustered in a way that we need more education, we need more acting on, on taking uh, seriously some of the uh, uh, medical prescriptions. Uh, those who want to be vaccinated will be vaccinated and so forth and no rollout. So not that South Africa, South Africa is doing something wrong, but South Africa is not efficient enough in, in informing people on time, I must say. It's, it's, it hasn't been very easy to do that because of the nature of, um, you know, um, the language, um, the educational system. Uh, rural people are probably not getting the same information, the quality of information as urban people are getting and the masses of our people are in these areas. So it's possible that, um, but also I might say that if we see, if we know that uh, we realize that Gauteng is the, 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 the core place where these things are happening, we could assume that, hey, it doesn't matter if you're educated or not, but the virus is just killing people. So South Africa is trying hard, perhaps communicating a lot more, as I said in my, uh, in my uh, piece here, Context, community, and communication. Health information, knowledge is a very important. Educating people, creating insight and wisdom, but also using local values and then compassion. That's all I can say at this stage. And hopefully, um, I think in the governance of the response to the uh, COVID-19 has been floundering a bit. I mean, we know that we don't have, we have an acting health uh, minister in the president's office. That doesn't bode well. I would say that's probably what's going wrong at this stage for me. All right, my my last comments uh, before you like you take your last thing would be mm. now in, in summary. Mm. Uh, this is what has uh, come up as as uh, the issues that we need to take home. One of the issues that you raise, which are important, is the issue of the strain resources, especially the health facilities. Uh, our hospitals cannot cope with the demand and uh, the African uh, 
community has taken uh, some step to try to combat uh, COVID, which is well appreciated. But the question that still remain in some of the, you mentioned concussions, in some of the alternatives that people are using, uh, the issue of intellectual uh, right, uh, uh, intellectual property rights is still an issue maybe that will require a debate on another day mm -hmm. because there are good things that are coming from the African approach that they are using, but the Western approach uh, seems to be dominant and at times not recognizing some of these or uh, even stealing the intellectual property. Mm. So those are the debates that I think uh, you need to be looking into. And then uh, one of the issues that you also uh, highlighted, which came strongly, is the importance of communication, especially in the rural uh, sector, that need to be improved. You talked about health literacy, uh, that it need to be intensified, and, and uh, the students uh, need to do some research. That was uh, an interesting point for me uh, in terms of looking at alternatives. But also uh, something that you need to also consider. In some of the facilities, people are using these unlabeled uh, sanitizers that are even causing some irritation uh, because they are not meeting the standard. And the monitoring of those to ensure that we are dealing with uh, issues. So at formal sectors, for, uh, compliance is ensured, but in some areas uh, there are loopholes and the abuse of the system. In my last comment, I'll be saying uh, COVID respects no title and respects no color and respects no border. Uh, therefore, we need to take it in our own hands uh, to stand against uh, and, and make sure that we, we are in the right. Your last comments and, and to wrap up our session, what is our take home message that you would like us to, to have in this discussion? Thank you so much, Dr. Poswa. You summarized it so well. I'm going to add two things. My takeaway for my, um, for my audience will be, the first one is vigilance in unity in Africa. I want to repeat this, vigilance in unity in Africa at all levels, but at continental level, uh, national level, country level, and local level. But most important, the second point is we need to communicate effectively for change on our own behavior. And in times of crisis, it's not easy to do so because we are so panicky. We don't know where to turn. We don't have the proper information. So the next element, in fact, the third uh, takeaway is educating ourselves consistently. The information is changing. Uh, there's a lot of fake news out there. We need to be able to be in charge of looking at the quality of the information to, to inform ourselves and to make the decisions that are necessary to unite against COVID-19. And it's gonna be with us for a while. And um, we need compassion. We need Ubuntu, being a bit, uh, have some empathy and solidarity and union. Thank you very much, Dr. Posa, and thanks also for your uh, to your audience. Thank you very much to everyone who has managed to plug in, and thank you very much for the insights you have provided and shared. Uh, you have not completed uh, the assignment. We are going to be having maybe another session uh, arranged with a more focus in some of the areas that uh, people have raised. And we're still looking forward maybe to receive even more comments. I uh, would like to thank our audience uh, who have been alive, uh, keeping us live uh, in the venue that we are in, sitting here. And also those who are not able to see, but uh, by your support uh, in uh, making a contribution uh, in this uh, webinar is much appreciated. And thank you very much for the ma marketing. Uh, our, our marketing unit and communication uh, at MUT and everyone who has been involved in organizing uh, uh, this webinar. And, and also thank you very much to our technical team who assisted us to make sure that everything went uh, accordingly. At least today I did not manage, uh, I did not cut off, unlike <laughs> other days. <laughs> so I hope uh, I will be having 
uh, that ongoing. And thank you very much uh, for everything else. And and then uh, I think now uh, we are coming to the end of our our session uh, until we meet next time. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Peter.